Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Ronald Merle. I'm lecturer at uh, Uppsala University. And uh, I will uh, give you a course about uh, extraterrestrial resources. Let me share my screen with you. Here we go. So, extraterrestrial resources. The, the overview of the course first, it will be, the course will be divided in uh, four uh, parts. The first part is about uh, basic concepts, the rational behind exploiting uh, space resources and the pitfalls of search activity. The second part is dedicated to the uh, distribution of elements in the solar system, that means we will, ask, we will have to go through uh, the processes of solar system formation and formation of the planets in the solar system. Part uh, three uh, is focused on the resources of the planets, rocky planets, gas and gas icy giant planets and their satellites, the resources in comets and asteroids, and part four is dedicated on resources of the Earth, Moon, the Moon. And as a conclusion, I will uh, talk about exploiting the extraterrestrial resources in the future. Part one. Well, until recently, exploiting extraterrestrial uh, resources was considered as sci-fi. Uh, you might have seen uh, movies uh, from the mid 80s about uh, space mining, but that is not sci-fi anymore. You can see the, the headlines of The Guardian uh, last, uh, last uh, month, NASA, is developing uh, programs uh, in collaboration with private companies to uh, exploit uh, the uh, resources uh, of the solar system and in particular of the moon. And I, I will talk about that uh, later in uh, this course. But in fact, uh, men uh, have been uh, using extraterrestrial resources since a very, very long time, probably since 3200 before Christ. That's the, the age of uh, iron beads, iron beads uh, that were uh, found in Egypt. And uh, many uh, civilizations uh, used meteoritic material uh, since the antiquity in uh, Tibet, Mesopotamia, the Inuit people, and ancient Egypt. And that is illustrated by this uh, beautiful uh, iron uh, dagger uh, of King uh, Tutankhamun. So it's not really new. We even believe that. Uh, until 400 uh, after Christ, uh, iron from uh, meteorites was used uh, in Eastern North America. That's the Hopewell uh, civilization. Many of uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the objects um, produced from meteorites were ceremonial uh, objects and small tools and they were uh, highly uh, precious for the people that made them because uh, this uh, metal iron was quite um, difficult to, um, to, uh, to smelt uh, and to work with. I need to uh, uh, 
uh, talk quickly about the difference between resources and reserves. You might have seen that uh, in the frame of the, our resources uh, unit. So quickly, reserves are the total amount of valuable elements or metal proven to exist and to be economic for mining at uh, present. That means that technology allows it and uh, market price makes, uh, makes it uh, profitable. Resources, on the contrary, are amounts of a valuable element or metal that might be accessible given the technology allows it, and if it is uh, uh, beneficial in terms of uh, market price. And this is uh, illustrated uh, by uh, uh, this figure, basically reserves are what we know and what we can access here. Resources, identified resources are much bigger and they might be accessible at some point given market price and technology. And finally, undiscovered resources is what we suspect. So in this case, extraterrestrial uh, resources are more or less here and possibly a small fraction of identified resources. And we will see that a bit later. More or less the same thing here for uh, copper, mine production, mine capacity, everything we know in a given mine. The uh, total reserves, that is what we can access, what we can mine. Resources, we might access that at some point and total resources, everything we suspect, and theoretical resources, again, that is probably what we suspect, what we might access in the future. Extraterrestrial resources are typically theoretical resources. And here, this uh, small uh, uh, figure showing the difference between resources and reserves, again, according to uh, the uh, market price. So exploiting uh, extraterrestrial resources or what we uh, would uh, name space mining, why? it is relevant. What is the rationale behind it? Well, there is a growing opinion in the public about mining being a hazard and that should be avoided if possible, if not banned at all. Why that? Well, obviously, there are environmental issues when we talk about mining operations dust uh, from the activity of a, an open pit mine can uh, contaminate air, particles in the air can be blasted away by winds, and um, that can be a health issue for uh, populations, populations under the wind, soil uh, contamination, particles from the mine, waste from the mine spread or spoiled on the on soil can contaminate uh, the soil many of uh, the um, the waste can contain uh, heavy metals or uh, poisonous poisonous elements like uh, arsenic and same thing for water uh, the waste are usually stockpiled. They need to be uh, isolated uh, from uh, water circulation or rain. Otherwise, the, the, the waste can be leached and 
and all the heavy metals or poisonous elements can uh, be washed into streams and into the ocean that is a concern for population uh, living downstream and that is connected to waste management um, the waste includes uh, solid material the tailings as i said they may they might contain uh, poisonous elements heavy metals uh, for uh, uranium uh, mining it could be also radioactive elements so uh, waste management uh, is critical. Uh, waste could be also uh, contaminated water and uh, uh, this has to be uh, properly uh, managed uh, in case of uh, 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 contaminated water. Uh, we have seen recently uh, dams um, that uh, uh, broke apart releasing all the contaminated uh, water downstream uh, that happened in, in Brazil uh, Brazil I I, uh, I think for one of the most recent uh, accidents and then there is also the concern about the uh, rehabilitation of the, the mining site once the mining operation uh, has uh, stopped. So, can we? Uh, what what uh, what can we do uh, on the site uh, if we have also um, underground uh, mining? There is the concern about uh, the ground collapsing if you have uh, uh, housing um, on the ground. So that could be an issue that is. What happening in uh, Belgium and northern France? So that is a concern. Another point is the jurisdictional uh, issues about uh, mining operations. Basically, a mine uh, needs land. Who owns the land? Uh, the mining companies uh, have to uh, buy the land from the private owners. So they might not be happy to sell uh, their uh, land uh, to a mining company, even for a good price. And again, what happens after the end of the mining operation, and that is connected to the, uh, the issue of the uh, uh, site rehabilitation. There is also a concern of the health and safety of the workers. Mining operations are not entirely safe. We have done uh, many progresses, but it's still a dangerous activity. We have seen uh, recently in South uh, America uh, major accidents in uh, underground mines. So that is also a problem. And there is also the impact on indigenous uh, communities. Uh, many mining operations are in remote areas uh, populated by uh, native uh, people. The mining operation, uh, the mining operations uh, might uh, lead to the destruction of sacred land for the uh, native people, the destruction of artifacts, the destruction of uh, hunting grounds as well. For example, the mining company Rio Tinto uh, blasted a 46,000 years old uh, cave, uh, which was a, a, sac a sacred uh, location for the aboriginals of northern uh, Western Australia. So that is one type of uh, issues about uh, mining on earth, but there is also the main issue that is uh, now uh, getting more and more uh, 
important for decision makers and the society is the exhaustion of terrestrial resources. And that might happen within 50 to 60 years. And we are not talking about quite uh, uh, rare uh, elements. We are talking about nickel, we are talking about manganese, we are talking about chromium, cobalt, vanadium, molybdenum, and iron. So that is a major concern. However, this is debated. People uh, think that is a wrong assessment and we might uh, be able to uh, <clears throat> use uh, other uh, resources in the future and we will not uh, run out of uh, supplies, basically. Nevertheless, there is a need for natural uh, resources in our uh, growing economy and growing society. We have a, a growing need uh, for elements uh, for the green tech. And then that leads to the question of new, res new resources or new locations. Uh, new uh, sources on Earth, that means we have to uh, have large-scale mining operations and we need to process uh, low grade uh, or because obviously since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution we have uh, used the uh, most obvious, the uh, easiest uh, accessible uh, um, reserves, so those reserves will be uh, soon uh, depleted, so we need to find uh, lower uh, grade ore. Then we uh, can also look for uh, new locations on Earth, that means going deeper. We uh, can go deeper uh, on the crust or in the mantle, but that is very complex. The deepest uh, mines are four kilometer deep. The temperature at the bottom of the mine is already 60 degrees. That means you have to cool down the air for the workers to uh, be able to operate uh, in the mine. That is a very complex and very expensive operation. We can go also uh, deep into uh, water in oceans at the bottom of oceans but that is also very complex and that is also very expensive however and that is the topic of this course many valuable elements are more abundant and more accessible in solar system than on earth if we have an efficient an efficient uh, space travel technology and if it is uh, um, uh, economically uh, um, valuable. But there is drawbacks and limitations of uh, exploiting, using the extraterrestrial uh, resources. First of all, there are two international treaties, Outspace Treaty 1967 and Moon Treaty 1979. That means no nation can claim ownership to any part of the moon or any celestial body. No country owns anything in solar system. But the legal status of uh, uh, mining space resources in, uh, is unclear and controversial. And uh, the US government, for example, uh, legalized in 2015 space mining and recently an executive order on uh, encouraging international support for the recovery and use of space resources uh, was passed in 2020, that means that 
uh, private companies can uh, use um, extraterrestrial resources for profit. Japan, Luxem Luxembourg, China, India, and Russia have the same legislation to uh, uh, guarantee access to their uh, private companies uh, to uh, extraterrestrial resources. However, uh, there's uh, such legislation is inconsistent with the uh, Moon Treaty I have just uh, mentioned. The main drawback, however, is the, the fact that we might uh, process the commodities on Earth. Such uh, Earth space uh, processing is uh, unsustainable. We need to fight Earth gravity to bring the commodities back to Earth and send spaceship, spaceships to uh, collect the commodities. So this is neither a fuel efficient nor economically sustainable process. We need spacecrafts with massive fuel tanks for small payload. This is an expensive hardware. We need huge spacecrafts to uh, have uh, an economically feasible uh, uh, activity. We need to bring a lot of uh, commodities back to Earth but that is highly risky. We have a high risk of failure during atmosphere entry or um, atmosphere exit. So we have seen many uh, pictures and uh, movies about uh, the space sh uh, shuffles uh, exploding uh, during uh, entry or uh, exiting uh, atmosphere. So NASA, but also private companies are developing what we call in-situ resource utilization. That means we will process the commodities uh, in space. And on the moon, this is a part of NASA's Artemis uh, program. I will spoke about that a bit uh, later. Okay, let's have a pause and we will continue with part two.